are really worshiping God and you are singing about His greatness, His goodness, everything about who He is, all of a sudden you start, you stop focusing on all the things in your life that don't seem to be going right. Have you ever noticed that? That the, the more you let yourself go and just worshiping and praising God for who He is, all of a sudden the stuff in your life don't seem so big anymore because we're singing about how big He is. So I, I just get excited because, you know, what happens is, and, and I, love, I love our church. I love when we're worshiping that we shout, we holler, we clap, we praise God. And when we get excited, we're not afraid to hide it. So, yeah. All right. So, so guys, we're in a, in a study right now um, going through what's called the Lord's Prayer. I like to call it the model prayer because the disciples went to Jesus in Luke 11. They said, Jesus Teach us how to pray. So Jesus says this then is how you are to pray. He gives them a model. It's not, you know, we repeat it. We've seen it on rugs. We've seen it on picture frames. We've seen it with all different kinds of backgrounds. And a lot of times we repeat it, but we don't understand it. In, in other words, we're really good at saying prayers, but we're really bad at praying. There's a big difference between saying a prayer and actually praying. And so we've been going piece by piece through this. So if today you're sitting there going, wow, I really liked this, then go back and listen to any of the ones that you missed. They're all there on our Facebook page, and they're there. So today, though, we're bringing it down. We have this week and next week, and then we complete the series. So we've been teaching on this Lord's Prayer. Today we're going to talk about victorious prayer, and we're just going to focus on the first part of a victorious prayer, and that is overcoming temptation. In Matthew 6, 13, it says this, Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know when you say amen, you know what that means? Let it be as you say. So, do not lead us into temptation. That is what we're going to look at. So that's, that's our primary focus. Next week we're going to talk about being delivered from the evil one. So the word temptation here is a word that many of you, um, it, it may not be the, the word in the way that you think. And, and most of us will look at this word and say, okay, the phrase here, do not lead us in temptation. This is a prayer. Lord, do not lead us into temptation. Many of us will automatically think, well, hey, that's pretty easy because God cannot be tempted, nor can he tempt anyone, right? So a lot of times what we do is because of how we've been taught in our lives, we will read something and automatically discard it because of a phrase somebody taught us, a phrase that we memorized. This is one of the things I'm going to warn us to be very careful of is that when we begin to put doctrine over the Bible. Because we can memorize phrases, and then we can discard biblical scripture. This is a part of the prayer. It, and, and who's teaching this prayer? Jesus. Jesus is teaching the prayer. Do you think that everything that he's saying in this prayer is pretty important and he meant to say it? So when he's saying, and you're not praying to the devil, you're praying to the Lord, you're saying, Lord, lead us not into temptation. And some of us, automatically, we heard that and say, well, he can't. This word is not so easily defined as you guys would think. In fact, let me show you something here. In James 1, verse 2 and 3, we, we see this passage. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various Trials. Everybody say trials. Very good. You're good at following instructions. All right. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Okay, good. Let me show you just a few verses in the same chapter. James 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Now everybody say temptation. Good. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, there's two different words in English, right? We see the word trial, and we see the word temptation. But when the Greek Bible, a lot of people, if, you, if you're a King James only, get over it. Just get over it. Because if, if somebody says, well, that's the only right one, you're wrong. Just going to tell you, and love, you're wrong. Because here's the deal, if you want to know the original... Learn Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. 
When you learn those three languages, then you can go back and actually get the correct. Because what you're taking is a different language, and then you're putting English words with it. So here's the thing, and the reason why I'm saying this is this. The word trial in Greek. The word temptation in Greek. What do you guys recognize about those two things? It's the same word. All through the New Testament, if you see the word trial, you see that Greek word. Every time you see the word temptation, you see that Greek word. And we see trials and temptations as different. That's why they put it different. Right? You guys following me on that? So a lot of times what we have to do is focus on the, the context of what's being said. Temptation, the, the definition for parismus is trial, temptation, also an act of being a testing from the Lord. So it can be a trial from the Lord or it can be a temptation from the evil one. It could be either or. Trial can be also being put to the test. You see, trials come from God. They are obstacles designed or allowed to happen in our life to strengthen our faith, just like James chapter 1 said. Consider it pure joy when you face trials because the testing of your faith produces perseverance or patience. But temptation, on the other hand, comes from the devil or the evil one designed to cause us to fall away from God or to get sidetracked from his path that he's provided for us. Now, I made sure that I checked that there wasn't any major big rocks lying around inside the church so that I wouldn't get stoned right after this first statement. Sometimes I make a statement on purpose to kind of rile you up a little bit. Because here's the thing is, is that as God is stretching me and challenging me in my understanding of the word, I should be doing the same to you. God cannot tempt you, but God can lead you into temptation. James, I like it. Thank you for the, the shock and awe there for the moment. I'm going to work on our tech team, and we're going to get a camera back, and I'll have certain people selected at different times to see if we can get you picking your nose or, you know, rolling your eyes, something, you know, that we can put on Facebook forever. Um, a lot of people will automatically think, I don't agree. But it's pretty hard to ignore Scripture. Jesus was then led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. See, a lot of times what happens is, and I'm going to get into this in just a little bit, but sometimes we get so indoctrinated that we automatically cancel out Scripture. I can't argue with this. I mean, that's really clear. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. If that's not enough, consider reading Job. God allowed the devil to attack Job in his life, in which in one day Job lost not one child, but ten. A lot of people can look at that and use that as their way of getting angry with God. I do not. I'm not living for this life. If you're living for this life, then you'll find all kinds of reasons to be angry with God. If you're living for just a good life now, you will have all kinds of reasons. But I'm not living for now. I'm living for what comes next. So if I die young... I found the shortcut, my friends, and I'm all right with that. Don't cry for me. I'll be home. My wife will get angry, bring me back to life just to kill me all over again. But you see, when one of the things when I see something like this, so many people struggle. And I start thinking, why do we continue sometimes to disagree so hard? when we see things in God's Word. Well, the first thing that I, I immediately thought, there's two major reasons why I think that we could see something in God's Word and completely ignore it. 
the first number one reason, I do believe, is because of doctrine over Bible. I grew up Mennonite. You know, if Yoder didn't throw you off there, right? <laughs> so, so they follow a doctrine, it's, it's called Arminian. And then I went, so I, I went to a public school um, and, 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 and played football and wrestled, and then I went on to college to play football at a Southern Baptist college that's not Arminian. Well, as I was in college, I was called to preach the Word of God. God called me into His service. And I was sitting there, and I think what really actually was one of the most eye-opening things for me is that my uncle was the Mennonite pastor, so and I knew him very well, right? And I was able to ask all these tough questions. And then I also had these professors in college, and I would ask them tough questions because I just looked at these two sides that would argue. And the arguing really seemed like a waste of time. In fact, I once almost had my funding stripped from me because I wouldn't agree with everything that the Southern Baptist said. They did not, because I asked them, I said, well, gentlemen, forgive me, I'm 20 years old, I have not got everything figured out in my life. At that time I was 20, I'm not anymore. But I said, forgive me, I don't have everything figured out. Do you guys have everything in the Bible figured out? There's no mysteries left for you? See, there's so many times that we get on get on these things of doctrine that I heard this and I got this taught and and I looked at them and I, I was I was thinking about going over a bunch of them I'm not but you know I, I was I was sitting there and I, I so I had I had some guys at this this church that I'd pastored a long time ago and I showed them something straight out of God's word and they're like yeah no I'm like what do you mean yeah no what do you mean no that's that's like that's, that's red. Red letters right there. Jesus said it. It's got to mean something. We're like, no, I'm Southern Baptist and I believe this. I'm like, I was completely fabriclasted. You know, I was like, I'm sitting here going, that is crazy. Okay, so, so the thing is, is this. If we get to the point to where we're Southern Baptist before we're Bible-believing Christians, we've got a major problem in our life. If you are Arminian or Mennonite or Methodist or Catholic or you're anything... Before you're a Bible-believing Christian, you've got a problem. I think denominations do a lot of great things, but when we put any denomination over the Word of God, when the Word of God says it, clear. Get out of the way. So we can see something in God's Word and say, oh, no, I don't believe that. That is a problem. And you need to check in your heart and say, is there some doctrinalization that's inside of me? See, I was so glad that I had two backgrounds because I saw a lot of flaws in both. Not because I think that they're so flawed. It's just like I saw the arguing and the debating and it never got anybody saved. Did you know that? I, couldn't, I never saw someone get saved from them focusing on their differences. I saw people get saved when we put our differences aside and ran towards the gospel. The gospel is something that every denomination agrees on. Jesus saves. So... I want you guys to, to, to stay there. So if I, if I allow any doctrine or any thought process that I've memorized, and I'm going to show you one that we use a little bit later in the passage that we twist to our own liking a lot, we're going to have a problem. We need to check our heart on that. The other thing that I want us to do, and the other reason why I think that we have an issue with sometimes seeing a passage and it tearing down the doctrines that we've so if we could just learn how to take those goggles off and just read the bible for what it says it does not mean so it doesn't mean i'm not southern baptist because i don't agree with everything that the southern baptist agree do you guys get me there i don't disagree with everything that the mennonites i don't agree with everything the mennonites say and i don't agree with everything the baptists do but here's the deal i'm a men and proud of it right you know what i'm saying <laughs> You know, like, I'm a little bit of everything. I'm kind of like that little mutt dog that has a little bit of everything. But here's the thing is that what I've learned is that I'm not influenced by doctrine. I'm influenced by the Word of God. What God's Word says reigns supreme in my life. And if it goes against somebody else says something, and I don't care how old they are, I don't care what their name is, I'm going with the Word of God every single time. So, now that we got that, I think that the other reason why we can see the Word of God and not allow it to change anything in our life is that our eyes and our ears are closed. 
So I had a, one of my dear lady friends in the church. I was telling her a, a story about a church that I had previously pastored. And I, and I taught f- for years with the same passion that I have now. I've never lost my passion for God's word. Never. And she's like, and I said, but it, it, it was to no avail. Have you ever done something over and over and over with all of your heart and it didn't go anywhere? You know what I'm saying? No one wanted to hear, no one wanted to change, no one wanted to listen, and you just felt like you gave everything you had every single week and you were just hitting your head on a wall. That's exactly what it felt like. And she's like, well, you're such a good teacher. How did that ever happen? Now, let me show you something. You know, I may be an all right teacher sometimes, but I will tell you this, Jesus is the great teacher, and yet people didn't listen to him either. You could have Jesus Almighty teaching you and still people will close their eyes and close their ears. The Jews did. They they saw him raise the dead. They saw him heal the sick and then they said, well, you must be a demon. They called Jesus a devil. They saw the miracles and still had somehow convinced themselves everything that Jesus taught was good. It was wonderful. It talked about love. It talked about grace. It talked about mercy and faith. All the things that we love to hear about. You must be a devil. You're a heretic. Mm. In Acts chapter 28, Paul says this, and there were some that were persuaded by the things which were spoken, but some disbelieved. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul and said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through the Isaiah. So this is what, what, what Paul's saying. He says, Isaiah spoke correctly. Go to this people and say, Hear, hearing you will hear, but you shall not understand. Seeing you will see, but you will not perceive For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest they should see and open their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand and with their hearts turn so that I would heal them. How many people miss out on healing? Healing in your soul, healing in your heart, because we've closed our eyes and we've closed our ears to the word of God taught to us. The saddest thing that could happen in any church today is the same thing that happened in the beginning of the church. Can you imagine somebody not listening to Paul's teaching? Right, I mean, think about this. We could go back and sit under the teaching of Paul or Peter, or John. I, Barbara would be at Peter's because Peter was a firecracker. She'd be like, tell him, tell him, Peter, get him. You know, like, I mean, like, I love you. So, but can you imagine, though, even then, they had these amazing teachers that we can look back and say, wow, what an honor it would have been to sit under that teaching. And they still didn't obey. They still didn't follow. They still didn't listen, regardless of their reason. So I'm wanting us to understand that when we see this word temptation, don't get caught up in the, in the phrase that says that God could lead us into temptation because a lot of times when we get to this part in the prayer, we say it and quote it, but we skip right over it. How many of us have honestly done that because it doesn't make sense to us? And it's okay. There's a lot of things that don't make sense to us. A lot of times we like, we just kind of power through it because like, lead us not into, God would never lead me into temptation. He led Jesus into temptation. And I'm going to get into how far he'll lead us into temptation in just a little bit, but I need you to understand Because if we say that he can't, then this shouldn't be there. And I didn't write it. I'm just telling you what it says. That's my job. Not to know everything, but to show you what the word says, not what I think. So, where does temptation come from? That's what I want us to focus on today. Where does it come from? So, we're going to stay in the book of James. 
Okay, And we're going to look at James chapter 1, and I already read verse 12 to you, so now we're going to come to verse 13 and 14. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, okay? For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. That is biblical truth right there. Hold on to it. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and then entice so my desires are one part of a temptation and then the being enticed to act upon them is another part there's two parts to this equation of temptation one I have a desire in my heart Every one of us was born with a sinful nature. We, were, we, 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 are, we have this desire inside of us to do the wrong. Paul even said in Romans chapter 7, Why is it that I'm doing the things I don't want to do, but I'm not doing what I want to do? Has anybody ever like, man, why do I keep doing the things I don't want to do? Why do I keep looking at the things I don't want to look at? Why am I looking for the things I don't want to look for? Why am I doing this? Why am I acting like that? Why did I say that? How many, uh, why did I say that? Okay, now everybody's here. Okay, so why did I say that? See, there is inside of you a desire we're drawn away by a desire. So temptation, one part of it, is I, am, I have a desire within me to do the wrong thing. We, could, we should all be able to say, yeah, right? There's something inside of me that doesn't want to do the right thing. Then there's a second part, the enticing part, and that's where the devil comes in. We're going to talk about that in just a second. You see, I want you to understand something. Desire is not the sin. When you act upon it, the decision to act upon it is. When I, the desire itself is not yet conceived into sin, it's a desire. There's something within me. There's a battle going on. My, my desire says, look. When, 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 when the Spirit's saying, don't, right? The, 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 the desire is to, to mouth off, to open my mouth, and, and, the, and the Spirit's saying, shut your mouth. So, James chapter 1, verse 15, the very next verse. Then, when desire has conceived, so the desire is not yet the sin, desire has to conceive to be the sin, you guys follow? There's a desire. The desire is not yet sin. Sin hasn't entered in the equation. Desire has to conceive. It has to give birth. It has to conceive. So when we're talking about conceiving, there's a decision that you say, I'm going to dwell on this thought. I'm going to go ahead and look. I'm going to go ahead and do this. So there's a point where you make a decision to go further. It gives birth to sin, but sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Whew. That's tough, right? So there's an individual sin. When I decided to dwell, when I decided to, 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 to hang out, when I decided to, to, to act upon that desire, sin has entered in. If I allow that sin to hang out in my life, that sin is going to beget more sin in my life. And sin, when not dealt with, brings death. For the wages of sin is death. Now, this isn't a physical death. It's even when Adam and Eve, when they sinned in the garden, he says, lest you die. They're like, we didn't die. We're not talking about a physical death. What this is talking about is a separation from the presence of God. Have you noticed that when you sin and you fall short of the glory of God, how you feel just a little bit further from God? How many of you can testify today that when you fall short, you feel a little bit of distance between you and the God above? Because that's what it does. That's what sin does. It brings separation from the presence of God. There's nothing worse than being outside of the presence of God. How amazing it is it 
when we've messed up all week long, we come into God's house and God's spirit starts raining down. In a moment we say, God, I'm sorry for this week. And all of a sudden you feel the flooding of the presence of God. Give glory to God for those moments, right? You've had some of those moments in your life, right? You messed up all week long. You walk into his house and you're like, God, I'm sorry. And all of a sudden the music takes over. The presence of God takes over. The word of God is planted. And all of a sudden we're sitting here saying, wow, I feel the presence again. That's when we get the sin far from us. That's what happens when we repent and we turn and we reject it. Anybody like chocolate cake? All right, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you a fact. Chocolate cake, you guys following me, cannot make you gain weight. Woo, come on somebody, right? Come on, let's, if you pray that it turns into a carrot on the way down, I'm just kidding, no. So here's the deal. A chocolate cake cannot make you gain weight. You guys don't look like you're a bunch of believers yet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be so bold. I'm going to go further. Two chocolate cakes are not going to make you gain a single ounce. Three chocolate cakes, four chocolate. I don't care if you have a hundred chocolate cakes. You won't gain a single ounce until you eat it. Right? You see, the desire that's within you is not, you're not, hey, there's a desire to eat the chocolate cake, but until I actually act upon that desire, I'm not eating it. Temptation is always going to be around your life. It's always going to be there. It's not a sin to have a thought when it pops into your mind, but it is to dwell upon it and then act upon it. Guys, you're going to have a hundred bad thoughts come in your mind. You know, wives, probably in a daytime, and and within a 24-hour period, you've probably thought about murdering your husband at least two or three times. The thought, the desire there for the moment is not the sin. Don't act upon it, okay? My wife never thinks about that. We we, we, we joke all the time because we heard um, Billy Graham once made this statement. They said, well, have you ever thought about divorce? He goes, no, but I've thought about murder. You know, we, we got married, it was till death do you part. So, I mean, the only way out of this, you know. So, okay, so we, we joke about that. We, we have a great marriage and there's no thoughts of, maybe there is this moment. There, but she's not going to act upon it, so she's not going to sin. I, I have full faith here, so. All right, so I'm wanting you to really understand that desire part, that that desire is not, is not the sin. It's, it's not a sin until you begin to act upon it. When the devil tempts you, then you act upon it. The desire is not the sin, but the decision to follow the desire is. Some people, there's no freedom in your life right now. There's no joy in your life right now. There's no healing in your life. There's no peace in your life. You're praying, you're asking God for all of these things. They seem so far away. Why? maybe they are maybe you've allowed sin to come into your life and drive the presence of God I want you to think I, 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 I thought so hard I was like how can I be healed by God outside of his presence how can I find freedom over addiction or over, over pain or over grief or over anything else outside of the presence of God I can't do that It is only in the presence of God that I find those things. And when I'm sinning and I have sin in my life, I don't have the presence of God right now. I'm not talking about losing your salvation. What I'm talking about is being uh, far from his presence. The Bible says you draw near to God, he draws near to you. There's times when we are drawing away from him by our actions and our attitudes. I want to read this passage to you in a moment. I forgot a pretty important part here. <laughs> One of the things I was thinking about how we, we're, 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 how we so often dumb down sin. I, I hope I can say it that way. We dumb it down. We have a bad habit of dumbing down sin and not really looking at sin for what it is. 
We, we, we stop calling it sin. We just say, oh, I made a mistake. Come, right? Come on. Oh, oh, it wasn't a sin. It was a mistake. Sin sounds so bad. So I'm just going to, you know, like, hey, I made a mistake today. No, you sinned today. Call it for what it is. What we do is we make something that God does not happy with, not pleased with. In fact, it says because of the sin in our lives, the wrath of God is on its way. So here's the deal is God's not playing around with sin. We keep dumbing it down. We keep calling it, oh, it's a mistake. Or, hey, I'm justifying it because everyone else is doing it. Guys, our entire nation is messed up. We've legalized sin, made it legal, made it okay, and we celebrate it. So if you think that because you celebrate sin with everyone else, that when you get and stand before God, it's going to be okay, you're wrong. God's not playing a game when it comes to sin. We justify it. Everyone else is doing it. It's accepted by everyone else. It's okay. No wonder God is so far from so many. Sometimes we walk into a church and we feel the presence of God and then we walk out and we don't. Maybe it's because we're feeling the presence of God to the person who's actually drawing near to him next to us. And we just feel the presence in the room. That was hard, wasn't it? That wasn't an easy one. Sometimes that's what's happening. Sometimes... We come in, we're like, wow, I felt God, but when I walk out the doors, I sure don't. Then check this real hard before you leave this place while you're standing in the presence of God. And if there's some sin in your life, deal with it. Don't dumb it down. Don't call it a mistake. Call it for what it is. It's causing a problem and a rift between you and God. Let me show you something. And I know that you can't hardly see this. You can look it up. Um, it's Second Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4. If God did not spare angels, I want you to listen to how strong this language is. Again, I'm just reading to you the word of God. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, what? Okay. But sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness, to be held for judgment. And if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought a flood onto ungodly people, but he protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. He's saying is if God didn't spare the angels, and if God didn't spare the world when it became ungodly, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and he made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for that righteous man living among them day after day was in torment in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. What he's right now saying is God ain't playing with sin. God is not playing around with sin. That is not a game you want to play. The other day, I got a call, and someone had, had died unexpectedly doing some things that they should not have been doing, living a life that should not have been lived. And the family then gets really distraught. Because all of a sudden, reality is setting in. My loved one didn't know God. We were wasting time. What happened if you died today? There was a wreck after the wedding yesterday. Could have been, someone could have died. My son passed away at the age of 14. No one in this room is guaranteed tomorrow. Not one of you is guaranteed another day. What if you died without placing your faith? That's hell. That's not my opinion. That is the biblical truth. And God isn't playing around with it. We have so many preachers that come in and they only want to talk about love. Well, God is love, but there's also God is wrath. You can't 
can't have one with and ignore the other. You have to understand that God is God and he is a good judge. And to be a good judge, he has to deal out good judgment. And you know what I deserve? I'm going to tell you exactly what I deserve. I deserve hell and damnation. That's what I deserve. But it was a gift of God that gave me eternal life. Nothing by what I did. Nothing. In the very next passage, in the very next verse, in verse 9, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, if this is so, so he said, and it is because God did it, we already know, you can go back to the history books, God, Sodom and Gomorrah, that's not hard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly. Whew, come on. Huh? If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment. What he's saying is this. If God isn't playing around with sin and you are going to live a righteous life before him and you're going to do your best to follow him, he says, I know how to protect you and I know how to give punishment to those who need it. So God's not playing a game. This is especially true for those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Man, that's, that's tough, isn't it? You see, God knows how to rescue. And I, I originally put you, but that's not actually what it says because God doesn't promise to rescue you. What does he promise to rescue? The godly. What does that mean? Right? Because I'm kind of flawed here. You know, I'm like, man, how many of you just would walk around and say, I feel real godly right now? Is there anybody that's like walking around and say, I, want, I feel real godly? Right? Most of us don't take that up, right? We don't want to wear that badge because if we do, then everybody's going to look really hard and find a reason why you're not godly. Do you know what godly means? That I have set Christ. So the Bible says, be imitators of Christ. I have set my life goal to imitate Christ. That's what it means to be godly. I am chasing after Christ. Christ. I don't have a righteousness of my own. I have that which has come from Christ. That's Philippians chapter 3 verses 7 through 11. Some of my favorite passages. Thing is, is this, as Christ takes over my life, as I surrender more and more and more of my life, he takes more, he takes over, and he takes over. And just like we said, God, your kingdom come. He invades my life, and I begin talking like I didn't used to talk. I begin acting like I did. Guess what? It's not me. It's God in me. That's godly. The Bible says, with contentment and go with godliness and contentment, there is great gain. When I let God take over inside of me and he's acting and willing through me, that's godly. So I'm not going to be the judge of that. You be the judge of that. And it doesn't even matter if you're the judge of that. He's the judge of that. Amen? See, God knows how to rescue the godly. The Bible says, be holy as am I'm holy. He says, imitate Christ. He's telling us throughout most of Paul's teachings in Timothy and Titus is talking about us chasing after godliness. Just because it's hard to get doesn't mean we shouldn't try. That we shouldn't seek out. That we shouldn't allow God to take over. God knows how to rescue the godly. And he also knows how to hold punishment for the unrighteous. I don't want to be on that side. So how do we overcome temptation? We're going to finish up this James chapter 1 passage. How do we overcome this temptation? Because that's what we're talking about, a victorious prayer of overcoming. How do I overcome temptation? So we're going to read this. Don't be deceived. That means don't be tricked. Don't be, don't be lied to. Don't be deceived, my bro brothers and sisters. Every good, perfect gift is from above. Anything that's good in your life is from God. Amen? Coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. We're going to talk about four things that we need to change in our life to overcome temptation. The first one I want to show you is this. We need to change your focus. Change your focus. Focus on God's goodness. 
God's goodness. I love this. So when I thought, started thinking about how good God is, man, you just can't stop thinking about how good he is, right? I mean, when somebody says God is good, your mind starts going to all the ways that God is good. Amen? God is good. What? You guys are terrible at this game. God is good all the time. All right, so God is good. When we start focusing on his goodness, you become more thankful in your life. Have you ever noticed that? Man, God, you're good. Thank you for this, and thank you for this, and thank you. You become, you, you begin to develop inside of you a spirit of gratefulness. Come on, somebody. Right? Come on. Right? When you really focus on how good he is, you start focusing on what he's given you, not what you don't have. Come on. That's good stuff right there. That'll preach. That'll preach. Come on, write it down. I mean, think about it. When I start thinking about how good God is and how good he's in my life, I don't start thinking about all the things that I wished I had. I think about all the things he's given me. Man, God's good. All the time. We focus on God's goodness, not, our even, not even our own shortcomings. Right? We really just start focusing on how good God is. Not on my weaknesses. Focus on Him and His goodness. The, thing, the second thing I want you to do is change your focus again. We're going to focus on God's faithfulness. When it says, come from the Father of lights, I really like this, with whom there is no variation or shadow. I love this. So as I look at this passage and I, and I start thinking about this, I, 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 uh, fa- here comes the Father of lights, right? We know that the Bible says uh, that, that Jesus said, I am the light of the world, right? So I got a question for you. I want you to consider the sun for a moment. Not S-O-N, but S-U-N, the sun that, that gives the sun light, okay? How many hours a day does it shine? Would you say that, that um, you know, it, the sun shines about seven, eight hours a day? Or maybe closer to 12? Or, or would you say it maybe depends on where you're at? Because there, like in, in Alaska... We have like some days where there's no light for forever, and then there's days where it never goes off, right? Am I kind of right on that? I'm not from, a, there's somebody, oh, Alaska person's upstairs. So how many of you would say it kind of depends on where you're at, on how long it shines? Raise your hands. How many of you have no clue how long? How many of you are completely lost? All right, good. My daughter's being honest. All right, so, right, so here's the deal. The sun actually shines 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it ain't shining. So when he says the father of lights, what he's saying is God is faithful. He's faithful in in all of the light. His light is shining when you're in your darkest moment. He's still shining. He's still providing light when the storm is all around you. He's faithful. You see, God God doesn't move. The earth is moving. Your life is moving. Circumstances in your life's changing. The seasons in your life are changing. All the things in your life are changing, but the sun never moves. He's a constant shining when you're on the other side of the rotation. But he's still shining. I want to show, share with you a passage out of 1 Corinthians. I'm going to, and, and I'm going to paraphrase. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1, like through all the way through 13. I'm not going to read it all. But here's the deal. He starts talking about how, um, really about all, a lot of the grumbling and the backbiting and the ego and the pride and the sin of the Israelites and how they kept, they, they got involved in sexual immorality and then God destroyed a bunch of them. They grumbled against him and God destroyed a bunch of them and kept, they kept getting all these punishments. And then it goes on to say it served as an example. But here's what I want you to also see. In verse 13 it says, not temptation... There's not a temptation. Let me find it here real quick. <clears throat> there we go. I kept talking and I forgot to change my notes. In verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. So there's no temptation that you're experiencing that's all of a sudden new. It's, it's been happening from the beginning of time. But God is faithful He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. 
And when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Here's where we take this passage and we twist it. How many times have you seen on Facebook somebody put the words, God will not give you more than he can handle? Have you ever seen that phrase, God will not give you more than you can handle? That is a twisting of this passage. It doesn't, there's not a verse in the Bible that says God won't give you more than you can handle. It says that God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle. When we twist God's word, that's when we get all messed up. I'll tell you what, when my son died, that was more than I could handle. I was broken. But when I was broken, God put me back together. Sometimes I have to have more weight on me than what I can handle so that in my weakness, he becomes strong. But when we're dealing with temptation, he's not going to let the devil tempt you at a place that you can't handle. So when you are struggling with an addiction and you're thinking about drugs or alcohol or sugar or whatever it may be, when you look at that, he says, I'm going to give you a way out. Look for it. I'm not going to let the devil put something in front of you that you can't handle. He always provides a way out. You see, the devil's on a leash. God's leash. God knows how long your trial is. He knows how long it's going to last. God knows how deep your trial is. God knows exactly how deep it is. He knows how long it is. And God knows the way out. So focus on the one who is faithful. To provide the lamp unto your path. The problem is that so many of us focus on our trials... We focus on our circumstances. We focus on the darkness. We focus on the pain. We focus on the hurt. We focus on the addiction. We focus on the one hurting us. That is the opposite. That is why we keep falling into the same temptation is because you're so focused on the circumstances of your life. You're so focused on who hurt you. You're so focused on everything but what you should be focused on, and that's the Lord Almighty. Focus on Him. He knows the way out. We need to change your focus. We need to focus on the word of truth. You focus on what God says, not how you feel. Right? I can't tell you how many times I I hear people say, well, I feel. What does God's word say? Because how many times, well, I feel. How many of you have felt that you're not good enough in your life? Raise your hand if you've ever felt that way. I feel like I'm not good enough. Uh huh. You weren't focusing on the Word of God, I can guarantee you. We need to focus on the Word of truth, not how you feel. You need to focus on what God says, not how you think. You see, the devil loves to hear what you feel. Come on, tell me. We've been learning about when, 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 on Wednesday nights, if you're looking for a Bible study, come on out. But when, 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 at 6 o'clock, we've been learning about the, the enemy sitting at our table. The devil loves to sit at your table. He wants to hear all about how you feel. He wants to know how you think. Tell me what you think about this. Tell me what you think about this. What do you think about that? How do you feel about that person? How do you feel about this situation in your life? When I'm focused on how I feel and I'm focused on what I think, I am not focused on God's word. I'm not focused on truth. In John 8, verse 31, it says, To the Jews who had believed, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. It doesn't say if you know my teaching, if you hold it. There's a difference between knowing it And holding on and standing on it. Then, see then, when you're holding on to the truth, then. 
See, it's not, it's not knowing the truth. It's when I'm holding on to the truth. When all I have is the truth of God and everything else around me is a storm and the life is crashing in and I'm holding on to the truth, then the truth will set you free. When I'm holding on to the truth of God's word, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I'm going to squash, I'm going to kill right now. I'm going to kill that whole insecurity that I'm not good enough. That some of you are walking around. You say, well, I'm a piece of junk. I'm a piece of trash. I'm no good. You know what? You, how many of you would believe that you are God's creation? Because the Bible says so. It says uh, he, he knit you together in your mother's womb. And everything that God creates is good. God doesn't make trash and he doesn't make mistakes. He's God. The moment you start letting the devil tell you that you're no good, well, you, the moment that you start letting the enemy and you start telling him how you're not good, you are not focused on the word of truth. It is the truth that sets you free. If you want to be free, if you really want to be free from thinking badly upon yourself, if you really want to be free from that whole I'm not good enough thing, then you stand on the word of truth because it's the truth that sets you free. So the last thing I want to, to tell you to change your focus on is this. Focus on his perspective and not your own. How in the passage it said that we become a first fruits. He says he chose to give us birth from the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits. Remember when you give your life to the Lord you are a first fruit of him. Anything less is a lie from the devil. problem is that so many of us are believing so many lies. We're believing so many lies. We're, we're, we are led away by a liar. How many of you really like, like you know a liar in your life and you, and you just love listening to them? Anybody? How many of you know a liar? How many of you love to listen to the liar? Right? I mean, the reality is this. You can't stand listening to a liar because you know what they're saying is lies. And yet we do it with the devil all the time. He's a liar from the beginning. He's the father of lies, and you're eating it up. He's feeding you lies, and we're eating it up. Because we won't stand on God's word, and we won't look at ourselves as God looks upon us. You're a first fruit. Being a first fruit's a big deal. Because first fruits in the Old Testament, you gave God the best of your first. When you give yourself, you're giving the best thing. You know what? God doesn't need your money. Now, I'm not saying to don't, you know, tithe and give offerings. You know, we, we encourage that. But, but God doesn't need it. God doesn't need any of those types of things. The best thing that you could ever give God, if you're like, I want to give him my best, give him yourself. Give him you. That's the best thing you have to offer is giving yourself back to your creator. That's the best thing. So when you give the best of the first, that's first fruits. God, that's what salvation is. God, I'm giving myself to you. God, I, I'm surrendering. I'm laying down my life. Come in and take over. That's what it's all about. Last page, guys, just letting you know. And it's only a paragraph. I mean, I don't know how long it'll take me to get through a paragraph, but it's only a paragraph. And I already made three of the statements without knowing it. So I want you to remember, guys, you're first fruits. If you have given your life to the Lord, you're a first fruit. You're not a leftover. You're not leftovers, you're a first fruit. First fruits aren't junk. They're not mistakes. They're first fruits. The most precious of the crop. See, that was what's so neat about the Jews, when they celebrated one of their feasts was first fruits. And they celebrated on giving the best of the first of the crops. God, we're giving back to you the best of what we have. And it was a huge celebration. When you give yourself over to him, it's a huge celebration. Because you're giving the best of what you have to offer, and that's you. 
God didn't make a mistake with you. I don't care how many mistakes you've made in your life. I don't care how many mistakes you've made. You're not a piece of junk. And you're not a piece of trash to be thrown out. You're precious. You're made in the image of God who loves you dearly. And he just wants you. Just you. If you would bow your heads this morning. Some of us today need some help changing our perspective. 